it's a real pleasure uh, to be able to introduce Helen Q uh, today, who um, is, is not only a rising star, but uh, she's gaining uh, quite a bit of fame, I, I think, uh, nationally, internationally, um, talking about, um, well, initially flu, but then, but then going on to the coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic or pandemic, where, where she's really been recognized for uh, her expertise. Um, Helen uh, received a, a BA from Cornell in 2001. And Helen, I, I think as part of uh, earning your BA, you did a little bit of a stint at Oxford uh, studying uh, psychology, philosophy, and physiology, I guess, which sounds like a bit of a sprint, uh, but then went on uh, to take uh, her MD degree from Duke in uh, 2005. And uh, <clears throat> after completing her internship and residency um, at uh, Harvard. Uh, she came out here as uh, a fellow in the division of um, uh, allergy and infectious disease, uh, where she is now an associate professor. Along that path, she also earned um, a master's in public health uh, in epidemiologic and epidemiology. Um, her research is focused on preventive and uh, interventions against influenza, uh, RSV, SARS-CoV-2, um, and uh, other emerging respiratory viruses. Uh, and she's been conducting, I think, as everybody knows, clinical and translational uh, research on large-scale community-based studies of respiratory virus. Uh, and within that kind of context, she uh, leads um, with, with other collaborators, the flu, uh, the Seattle flu study, uh, the Seattle coronavirus Assess assessment network study, SCAN, uh, and um, is also the PI on the Husky coronavirus uh, testing effort. Um, she's also interested in defining the clinical and immune correlates of protection against respiratory viruses and describing mechanisms of maternal fetal immunity against uh, respiratory viruses. Uh, today, the title of her talk is Infectious Disease Research and Implications for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Helen? Um, yeah, and also I have to thank Helen in particular uh, for condescending to talk to us. Plebeians, uh, not through CNN or some of her other national outlets, uh, but directly here in a science and medicine lecture. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much, Dr. Slattery, and, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited to be here and to share with a broader audience um, some of the work that we've been doing over the last year. Um, and uh, are my slides up? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, I changed the title of my slide at the last minute. Um, it's it's now, but it, it's the same uh, same theme. It, I've called it the end of the beginning preparations for a pandemic, and really the idea of Changing it was sort of to think about what we learned in this pandemic as a preparation for the future pandemics that are yet to come. Um, and I know that's sort of a pessimistic view, but I do think that there are many lessons that we have learned over the last year that can be applied to better prepare us in the future. And I hope to share with you some of the work that we've done in the space. So these are my disclosures. Um, and this is the outline of my talk. So um, in in my talk, I'll be going over three um, separate sections. The first is Seattle Flu Study as a pandemic surveillance platform, focusing on community-based surveillance strategies that we developed for flu, um, evaluating um, home diagnostics um, as a treatment for flu, and how we pivoted all of those things in response to coronavirus. And then in the second half of my talk, I'll be focusing on um, on a study that we've been doing for the last year um, called the Harvey cohort, which is an immune profiling study to map the clinical and the immune response over time to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in this part, I'll be talking about our work defining long COVID, the evolution of the antibody response over time, and looking at the effect of new variants on antibody escape. And finally, some future directions for our research. So um, I'm presenting these, these results on behalf of a large group of investigators. Um, there are over 250 people who work on the Seattle flu study now. And here are the PIs, as well as many of the investigators who have been working on the trials I'll be describing. So, uh, so I wanted to start first by talking about flu. Um, flu is a platform for, for what we're doing now. And, um, and sort of the lessons that, 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 uh, lessons that we learned from 1918. 
So in 1918, the world population was close to 2 billion. Um, the primary mode of transportation was troop ships and railroads, and it took about four months for the virus to circulate the globe. Um, the measures that were in place to prevent spread including ma included masks and disinfectants, which were many of the same things that we had here initially. And then um, the treatments that were available at the time were bed rest and aspirin. And it was estimated that 2% of the population or 25 to 50 million people died due to 1918 flu. As compared to what is happening now in 2021, the world population is closer to 8 billion. We have airplanes that allow a virus to circulate the globe in less than two days. But thankfully, we also have vaccines and antivirals that are now available after development at really warp speed over the last year. And the estimated death toll thus far is 2.2 million and counting from SARS-CoV-2. So when we started the Seattle flu study, it was 2018, and it had been 100 years since 1918 flu, and we felt that another pandemic was inevitable. And the current surveillance strategies in the United States were really not designed to, de to detect novel pathogens. So the goal of the Seattle flu study was to develop a pandemic surveillance platform that could be used to identify new pathogens and to develop strategies to contain their spread before the months to years it would take for a vaccine to be developed. Surveillance strategies for flu back then, as they are now, really rely on people coming in for care. So it relies on reports from clinics and hospitals of flu positive samples that arrive in, in, the, um, in the lab or on reports of syndromic surveillance um, uh, from hospitals or emergency departments, people coming in with influenza-like illness. And critically, the group that this really misses are people in the community who don't seek care. And these people may contribute to spread in the community. They could introduce novel strains into the community through travel. And they may provide an earlier signal of flu activity than hospitalized patients. So the question really is, can we capture people um, with flu in the community who are not care seeking? Okay. Um, there's a little bit of background noise. I was wondering if those who weren't speaking could mute. Thank you. Okay, so um, so one of the other things that we wanted to evaluate in our study was really to understand the performance of home testing for respiratory viruses. And this was something that we thought would be important, particularly in the setting of a pandemic, because it would allow us to be able to um, diagnose and to be able to treat without people um, going into the clinic or the hospital, exposing others, and potentially using a valuable personal protective equipment, um, which we felt would be scarce during a pandemic. So about two years ago, we started discussions with a couple of companies um, about use of their home diagnostics tests for influenza that were in development in the time. And these rely on, on self-repair and collection of a nasal swab. They have a molecular and antigen-based readout. And then based on the readout um, of a positive result, that would then link to care and receipt of an antiviral. The pros of using a home diagnostic test for a respiratory virus such as influenza or SARS-CoV is that you don't expose others. And, and also the rapidity of the diagnosis. There's no delay because it doesn't require you to go anywhere, see a provider and then get diagnosed. And the questions we really wanted to answer is first of all, is this even possible? Can people do their own tests and get the result? And is the result valid? How does it compare to a molecular gold standard? And is it actionable? So two years ago, we started conversations with seven different companies who were working on these home diagnostics. And one of the companies that we talked to was um, Illum and another one actually was Lucera. And we decided to work with Illum and Illum happens to also be one of the, the first company in the United States who now has an emergency use authorization for their, um, for their coronavirus test. Um, and so the platform that we studied in our, in, um, two years ago was, was also the, is the same platform that's, that is currently in use EUA in the United States. So the questions we wanted to ask were, are people able to self-collect a swab for testing? And then what do they do with that result once they have it? So the strategy that we employed for the Seattle flu study was, was, was uh, several fold. We wanted to first expand testing to the community, to college campuses, child cares, workplaces, homeless shelters, and transit stations where people really would be walking around with respiratory viruses. We wanted to build a high throughput lab that could identify multiple viruses at a time and to design a new test and have the ability to rapidly flex to design new tests for novel pathogens and to do whole genome sequencing to map chains of transmission. And then we wanted critically to be able to merge these data, these two pieces of data, the clinical data and the laboratory data quickly so that we would be able to then take action based on what we found. 
And then finally, we wanted to understand whether or not it would be possible to diagnose and treat pathogens at home, because we felt like in a pandemic, that was really the place where we wanted to be able to take action. So this was sort of the first part of what we did. We developed something called um, uh, Seattle we studied kiosks. We designed these kiosks, which we placed all over the city of Seattle. And you may have seen them. We had them on the university campus. And people come up to the kiosk and they um, essentially uh, uh, are screened for eligibility. We ask if they have had any of the following symptoms in the past week. And you can see here out of the symptoms listed, the ones on the right are um, represented less than 1% of the eligible illness episodes. If they were eligible to participate, we consented them. They completed a questionnaire about their symptoms on the tablet and we collected a nasal swab and they received a gift card for participation. So we had these kiosks placed all over the city um, in, in places like the international airport at arrivals at the baggage claim um, at workplace cafeterias on the University of Washington campus under the Space Needle everywhere that we thought normal healthy working adults would be walking around and potentially carrying a virus. We we're also in clinic waiting rooms and urgent cares. And then as a, as a simultaneous comparison group, we collected samples that were collected um, from the hospital. So we took in samples from four hospitals, three adult hospitals and one pediatric, sample, uh, pediatric hospital. These samples were collected at clinician discretion. So individuals would come into the hospital or the clinic, they would get sampled by their provider. And then, um, and then we would take the residual sample and all of their clinical data from the electronic medical record. And then we took this group and, and used it as the comparison group. And really to be able to do this study and do it well, we had to have buy-in from the community. And here I've just sort of put a, a, a snapshot of some of the groups in the community that allowed us to, to work with them. And it was really remarkable how many people in Seattle were willing to have us come to their site, um, set up a kiosk at, at an inconvenience to them and then do um, do testing of people there. So we were able to be in places like um, the public schools. We were in private schools. We were in the um, the basically the the um, arrival zone of the international airport, which was uh, actually quite a hurdle to get into. Um, but we worked with CDC and TSA and Customs and Border Control and nine homeless shelters throughout the city. So it really represented a, a large community effort to get this done. The other piece of this was that we wanted to be able to give people a way to, um, to be able to swab at home. And that, that to, to us seemed very critical. Um, that, you, that if you were sick enough that you were out, but you weren't coming in for care, but you were sick enough that you weren't actually sort of out in the community, would, there, would it be possible for us to be able to have a website where you would go to the website, seattleflu.org, click on a button, um, enter your symptoms, fill out the consent, and then have a swab kit arrive at your house in two hours. And so we did that. Um, so this was the, the website that we developed and um, this was a massive logistics lift um, really led by, um, by the Brotman Beatty team and, and all of the people who, who work there on how to actually um, get um, basically a production facilities for thousands of swab kits to go to people's homes within two hours of clicking on a button. And this is the, the, what we call the quick start guide, which we sent with the kit. And it, it gives people instructions for how to, how to collect their own swab, to package it up appropriately, and then to send it back to us. So once all of these samples came in, either through the kiosks in the community or through swab and send or through the hospital samples, we would then put them through a multiplex RT-PCR platform that tested for 26 different pathogens simultaneously. And then those that were positive were then moved, uh, positive for influenza were then moved on to whole genome sequencing. So the results from that very first year were pretty good. We enrolled over 5,000 people in the community. We found 20% of them had flu. We had 12,000 samples from the hospital and 20% of them had flu as well. So we were able to achieve the same proportion with influenza detected in the community as found in the hospital. Um, we found that many of the people in the community had influenza-like illness. Um, we also found that being younger and enrolling in a waiting room or urgent care were more likely to be associated with having a positive flu test than those who are just out and about. Um, and we were, critically, we were, we were not very successful at, at getting people within 48 hours of their symptom onset. That this was not, that only 20% of people were able to enroll within 48 hours of symptom onset. And this is something that's sort of seen again and again in the flu world. We want to get people early because the earlier you get them, you diagnose them, you isolate isolate them and you treat them and you prevent onward transmission. And we tried and we were good, but we weren't, we weren't at our, what we wanted to do, which is 75%. 
Critically, of the adults that who we enrolled, 21%, only 21% reported having sought care for their illness. So 80% of the people in the community that enrolled in our study never sought care. Um, and I think that was really important because it, it told us that we were actually capturing a different piece of the population. A group that was not necessarily care seeking would not be captured by traditional means. This is a view of MetaBase, which is a, a, a platform developed by Trevor Bedford. And it basically shows um, the different viruses that were circulating in Seattle during that first season. So first you can see that, that we saw H1N1 um, in the light yellow, followed by uh, a later peak of AH3N2, which is um, one of the other strains. And then, so we took those, whole, those flu positive samples and then we subjected them to whole genome sequencing. And this is a phylogenetic tree visualized on nextstrain.org, which is Trevor's platform. And what you can see here on the bottom is time. And then each of these dots represents one genome that was sequenced. And the red ones represent the ones sequenced from Seattle. So the first thing to note from here is that really we saw quite, we were able to sequence a lot of genomes and probably um, we were, we sequenced more than um, any other site in the, in the world. Um, that Seattle really had quite um, a number of genomes that were uploaded to, to uh, this publicly available database. When we looked at um, this very, very intensive sequencing and looked at what it showed us. It showed us that there were multiple different, um, different clusters of flu that were entering into the city over the course of one season. And that some of them would extinguish very quickly and then some of them will, would pick up and cause um, larger outbreaks. You can visualize be this better on this um, graphic where here you can see the phylogenetic tree on the left and then the city on the right. And you can see these strains as they enter into the city and then they spread. And so that very first one that we caught was one that was in January that was from an individual um, who was a college student um, that we detected on the college campus. And that strain was very related to what was circulating in Europe at the time. So we were able to really sort of map how viruses were, influenza was sort of entering and spreading throughout a city. So then we entered into um, sort of the, the second year of the flu study and we were really sort of at the point where we, there were a couple of new things we wanted to do. And we felt like, you know, for flu, you always need at least two to three seasons to really make any, um, make any conclusions. But of course, at the beginning of the second year of our study, um, coronavirus arrived. And as many of you may know, um, the, the work that we um, did early in uh, January, February, uh, led to um, identification of community spread in Washington State. And all of this really built on the earlier work that we had done, the, you know, the home testing, the rapid um, diagnostics, the whole genome sequencing that allow, allowed for sort of um, geographic links between these cases, epidemiologic and geographic links between these pieces. And so that, that was what really allowed us to, to make this um, discovery in, uh, in February. So these are the results from, from the, um, the work that we did. Um, and so what you can see here is that these are people who are coming in for testing. Time is on the x-axis, number of tests on the y-axis. And the, overall, we had lots of tests being done, a real peak up here um, after uh, sort of people found out more about Seattle flu study. But, um, but we, we found our first cases at the end of February. And we tested all the way back to January 1, and we found no other cases. So really, that was the first case that, that we found in our study. Um, again, this is a phylogenetic tree. This time it's SARS-CoV-2 as opposed to flu, but you can sort of see the same patterns, multiple different entries, and then some of them extinguish, and then some of them pick up and spread. The notable things that we, we found um, were so that, um, again, so 2,300 individuals, they enrolled in our swab and send study. 25 of them had SARS-CoV-2 detected, and, um, and the first case was at the end of February. Um, just like for flu, we found that only a small proportion of them reported seeking care for illness, and that very few of them, again, had symptoms for less than two days at the time of sample collection. So we weren't capturing them as early as we would have liked to be able to prevent onward transmission. So since that work, we've now converted this study to SCAN, which is a partnership with Public Health Seattle King County, really um, turning swab and send into um, a public health um, surveillance platform, and we've completed over 30,000 tests. And what you can see here is that essentially the results are very similar, that um, very few positives, um, but of the positives, even fewer sought care for their illness. So that we were able to really sort of identify people who were not necessarily going to be captured by other more traditional means. One of the questions that comes up when we look at sort of this home-based sample collection is how does that compare to uh, 
sample that's collected um, according to a more gold standard method, which is a nasal pharyngeal swab, like the brain biopsy, um, that is collected by your, your provider. And so this was work that was done by Denise McCulloch, who is a fellow in our lab. And she did a comparison study of people who were coming in to, to um, Northwest and Harborview drive through clinics um, for testing. And she provided them with home swab kits. So after they had their swab collected at the drive through clinic, they would go home and then using their home swab kits would, um, would then follow the instructions and swab themselves. And overall, we found that it was pretty good, that it was 80% sensitive and 98% specific as compared to the gold standard nasal pharyngeal swab. Keep in mind that this was also the second swab that was collected several hours later after the first swab. So viral load may have gone down a little bit in that time period, but probably not a lot. Um, in a sensitivity analysis of the swabs with CT values less than 32, so the lower the CT value, the higher the viral load. Um, so in a sensitivity analysis with, of swabs with CTs less than 32, which um, the sensitivity of home swabs was 95%. And there was just a paper actually published in New England Journal a couple of days ago, which, which um, analyzed CT values and found that CT values under 28 are, correspond to viable virus. And so well, I think what we can comfortably say is that if you, are, um, if, you have a, if you have somebody who has a CT value of 28 with viable virus, home swab can detect it. Um, and that both the, the home swab and the provider collected swab were highly concordant. So um, one of the other things we wanted to, to understand is, is this idea of home-based diagnostics, not just home-based swab collection, but actually diagnosing and taking action at home. And to, and to develop really a platform to do this in a completely remote manner. So we enrolled families with young children in collaboration with Seattle Public Schools. We enrolled them and then sent them weekly text message or email surveillance for illness episodes. And then we provided them with the Illum home test, which is the same one that's now um, FDA EUA, has an FDA EUA for SARS-CoV. So they, they then tested themselves at home using the home flu test, and then they would um, then be connected to telehealth. And then the telehealth provider would, would then prescribe them Biloxivir, which is a one-dose antiviral for influenza, and that would be delivered to their house. And we also had them simultaneously collect a swab and send it back to us so we could do a comparison study of performance. So we found that people did pretty well. Um, so overall, we had 185 households enrolled, 38 cases of lab-confirmed flu from 30 households. People used 164 of these home flu tests, and we provided antivirals to 16 sick participants, and 80% of these occurred within three hours of prescription. Um, so 31% of the antiviral deliveries occurred within 24 hours of symptom onset, um, which was remarkable because, as, as you remember, people are not necessarily going to be... Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute this. Okay, okay great. Um, Okay, so 31% um, of antiviral deliveries are occurring within 24 hours of symptom onset. And the way that this test works is that, this is the swab here, um, people put it up their nose, they swab on both sides, they put it in this reader. Um, it, um, it's a, uh, it's a, it has a fluorescence intensity that corresponds to the positivity and the fluorescence intensity then transmits via Bluetooth to your smartphone. And then the smartphone will, will provide a readout of a positive or negative result within 15 minutes. And so, um, so we found that people were able to do this. That they were able to self-collect a swab, to drop it in the reader, and then to, um, to get the result back. And that compared to um, a molecular test that was done on a swab that was collected at the same time, found a sensitivity of 69% and a specificity of 96%. And I think this, this in particular has real implications for as we get to a point where we may potentially have um, therapeutics for coronavirus could be administered early, but even in the time being, it allows for early home-based diagnosis. One of the other pieces of this, which I thought was really important, was that we compared um, response rates with text messaging versus emails. And we found that people, first of all, this red line at the top represents the number of people who responded each week, that we had very, very high compliance, that most people were responding at around 95% of people responding every week. But we found that people who got who were sent text messages for symptom tracking were, were um, significantly faster in their response times compared to people who got emails. So that if you were to pick a method to be able to do um, regular symptom tracking of individuals, text messaging was probably the right way to go. 
Okay, so these are the lessons learned from that part of our study. So we found that um, biospecimen repositories linked with clinical data were essential for real-time identification of novel pathogens. Community-based studies really provide an opportunity to find pathogens early and take steps to prevent further transmission. And that contactless ways to test, diagnose, and treat for respiratory viruses may provide a strategy to limit exposure to ill individuals in the time of a pandemic, although early identification remains challenging. Okay, in the next part of my talk, I wanted to go over some new data that we have about Husky coronavirus testing. So Husky coronavirus testing was led by Anna Weil and Sarah Solberg. Anna Weil is a junior faculty member here at, at UW and Sarah is a research coordinator in my lab. And this was really a massive effort over the course of the last several months. So the way this study was designed, and many of you have probably heard about this from the university, it's a prospective longitudinal cohort study. We enroll any faculty, staff, or student um, at the University of Washington. Enrollment is virtual. We really felt that the, this worked well for the household studies. We provide daily alerts for symptom logs, so either text or email, same as the household studies. And then importantly, we provided seven day a week access to testing, either at the kiosk, like we use for Seattle flu study, or via, via swab and send, so a swab kit going to your house. And the study is going to be conducted from um, September until June of this, of this year. And it's free to participate. And then people enrolled in this study self-collect a nasal swab in the presence of um, a research assistant or do um, unsupervised home self-collection. And then we do RT-PCR for SARS-CoV-2. And the results have been returned within 24 hours. And the way that people get their results is that we give them a barcode when they enroll and the, you type the barcode into our website and then your result is returned to you. And then if you're positive, you're also, you also receive a phone call. So how do people test? Um, so, you know, when we first started the study, it was actually really, really difficult to sort of figure out what the right approach would be. Some people said you have to test all the time, every single person, twice a week, and that's the only way to control things. And other people said, um, just, don't start class. It's, it's just, it's impossible to control it. So let's just completely lock down. We, we were in this situation where, you know, classes had, were, had, had already been decided to have um, on-campus learning. Um, we were asked to come in and design a strategy that would rapidly contain outbreaks before they spread. And the things that we, we knew we had were that we had, you know, all of these, these pieces in place from all of our stu other studies that we can employ. We also knew that we had limited limited um, supplies and reagents, that we would, were not going to be able to um, test twice a week every single person. That, that was not going to be possible. So we, we designed a different type of strategy, and this is what we did. So everybody who enrolled would get a baseline test. We would then have them do their daily check-in, asking about high-risk exposure, symptoms, or gatherings. And if they were positive on their daily check-in, one to two hours later, they would get a text or email alert to make an, an, an appointment for a test. We also did surveillance testing in the community. And then critically, and this became really important, we did surge testing, which is outbreak testing. So once a case, a certain number of cases was identified within a small community, we would then activate to identify all the members of that community enrolled in our study, and we would start testing them every three days until the outbreak was controlled. So overall in the fall, we enrolled about, actually this number is updated now, it's probably 17 or 18,000 participants. Um, about 6,000 people completed their daily attestations. We had an overall positivity rate of 0.8% and a turnaround time from swab collection until results of under 24 hours. Um, when we had, a, we found that the people who were most likely to be positive were either close contacts with known COVID cases or those who reported symptoms, but the baseline testing had a positivity rate of, that was much lower, 0.8%. This graph on the right just shows the different pieces, the different types of attestation positives that we had. And you see it was really a mix. People, a lot of people had symptoms, a lot of people had a, a contact, and a lot of people were in a gap, unmasked gathering of uh, more than a certain number of people that was indoors and reported it to us. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to understand whether or not um, the epidemiologic curve, of what was happening on the university tracked with what was happening in the community as a whole in King County. Um, or whether or not um, the University of Washington was existing in and of itself. So this is an epi curve showing the percent positivity here in the blue line of the cases in King County over this time period. Here on the bottom, what you can see here are, are the, the different subgroups in our population. And we really divided this into three groups, Greek students, non-Greek students, and employees and staff. And what you can see here all the way at the bottom is that um, the number of the employees and the staff and the red line really had their sort of 
They're smaller peaks, but they still had their peaks that tracked very closely with the community as a whole. But then if you look at the Greek community, that they had their own separate um, set of events going on here that was separate from what was going on in the community and also separate from what was going on in the, um, in the staff and, and the faculty and the other students. So um, at the end of September, um, right as actually we were launching the study, an outbreak was identified on, within the Greek community. So we launched this outbreak testing. And as part of this, people were invited to test every three days. And what you can see here is um, the results from individuals who, who were enrolled as part of this Greek community outbreak. Each box represents one person. This is a subset of the overall numbers that sort of illustrates the point. Time is on the x-axis. Each box is one individual. The red dot represents a positive. The, the blue represents an inconclusive. And the green represents a negative test result. And the important thing to note here is that we people were tested every three days or asked to test every three days, only some of them complied. And what you can see here is that many of the people who eventually turned positive started out negative. Um, and so that we were able to capture people very, very early in their illness through this approach. And I think that's really important because we know that if you capture it early, you can contain its spread. We then compared the viral loads in the individuals who were pre-symptomatic versus symptomatic. And we found that overall, um, many individuals who were pre-symptomatic actually had viral loads that were quite high. The 28 here, which was about here, is about sort of the line for viable virus. And then many, many, half of the individuals who were pre-symptomatic that we captured in the study had viral loads that were high enough to have viable virus. And, and I think even though we know the, symptom, the symptomatics in our study had higher viral loads, the important point here is that the pre-symptomatic did as well. Um, that they were actually quite, um, quite likely to, to um, lead to onward transmission as, the, as those who are symptomatic. So an approach of just testing symptomatics only in an outbreak is probably not going to do enough for containment. So then we wanted to really sort of understand, um, to use whole genome sequencing to understand whether or not we were able to contain the outbreak. So this is a phylogenetic tree. This is time on the x-axis. Um, the diversity of the strains through all of, um, or a subset of Washington state are represented here. The, each of the dots, um, the color of the dots tells you where the strain was identified. So the, um, the blue dots are from King County as a whole. And you can see that over this time period, there was quite a, a diversity in the, the genomes that were sequenced from all of King County. The, Red dots represent samples that were collected from faculty and staff. The light blue dots represent non-Greek individuals. And then the orange dots represent the Greeks. And what you can see here is that there were, first of all, several clusters that were observed. Um, and this was really work that was led by Amanda Casto, who is a junior faculty member who works with, with us. And we found that the Greek samples tended to cluster with other Husky testing samples, whereas the non-Greek and the faculty staff samples were more diverse. They were more spread out here. One of the interesting things to note here, and, and you know, it's a little bit early to say for sure, but is that this seemed to be a cluster that did not lead to sort of over, uh, to spill over into the general community. And I think when I last presented this data, we didn't even have this. In about a month, we'll have more than this, and we'll be able to probably make some, some more firm conclusions about how, how successful we were at containment with this strategy. This is a, a close-up of these, of these uh, genomes. And what you can see here is that um, es essentially it all started in the Greek community. And then there was a little bit of spillover into non-Greek students. But really we did not see um, evidence that this went off campus or into the general community based on the data we have now. So some conclusions from, from this part. Um, so we found that the highest positive view rates were among those who had tested positive to a known exposure or who had new symptoms and lowest among those who were undergoing routine testing. That the Greek community and the remainder of the U UW community had distinct epi curves and that repeated testing of individuals during a surge event was really essential to capture early infections during an outbreak, many of whom were pre-symptomatic and have viral loads that, have, that are uh, correspond to viable virus. Um, that when we used whole genome sequencing to really map out spread, that we found that the Greek community cases really clustered together 
and that there was indication of an event in mid-September, potentially start of school, um, rush, uh, any number of events where people congregate. And then that led to explosive growth of the virus within the Greek community. And that there was no evidence to spill over from that thus far. Although the caveat is we have not gone far enough to really know for sure. Um, so this study is, is ongoing. Um, I'll have more data to present as, as things go on, but I wanted to show this. Um, and I wanted to, to um, finish this part of the talk, really talking, uh, showing some of the, one of the graphs that we have from our meta-based view, which is looking at all pathogens over time. And we thought this was really nice to show because it really is, sort of shows you that, you know, the, that very first season, we were able to see all sorts of viruses that were circulating in Seattle. This dip right here corresponds to snowpocalypse, um, that event where um, everything shut down for two weeks and schools were closed. And then things started peaking again. And then with lockdown and with closures, you can see that we've seen virtual elimination of all other pathogens here in Seattle. But the only things that are really still circulating right now are things like rhinovirus and, um, and SARS-CoV-2. So. Um, some future directions. So I didn't have a chance to talk about some of the work that we do in homeless shelters, which is actually a large part of, of my, my work. Um, so we've been evaluating an on-site testing and treatment strategy for influenza in homeless shelters, um, mapping transmission dynamics in homeless shelters and households with young children, um, and then developing a framework for testing of students to allow for safe return to school in collaboration with local public schools. We're developing algorithms with Apple for physiologic predictors of illness using wearables. And then we're working to establish population level vaccine effectiveness studies um, over the, the course of the next several weeks. Okay, so now in the last third of my talk, I just wanted to talk about some of the work that we have done um, to do immune profiling um, through a cohort that we established called Harvey. And the reason for this um, was because it became evident early on that the biospecimens were needed for development of vaccines and monoclonals. Seattle, as all of you know, is the location of the first US site of COVID. And we knew that transfer of biospecimens around, across international borders is incredibly challenging. Even, even within the US, it was incredibly challenging back then. Um, but that studies of, of individuals who had the infection were critically needed to be able to develop vaccines and therapeutics, to establish correlates of protection, to develop treatments, and then to map evolution, especially in response to infection as compared to vaccine, and then to, to look at the effect of these new variants. So we happen to have an ongoing study already in place to look at respiratory viral infections, and then we quickly utilize this to establish a cohort of individuals with COVID-19. So first and foremost, I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of the work that we did early in the day was really to get samples to the people who could do the work. Um, and so this is a lot of the people that, that got those early samples, and we have many others that we gave them to, but the work that we did to get samples to Barney at NIH to help develop the Moderna vaccine, to Dan Baruch to help develop the Janssen vaccine, um, to Rob and to um, Jim at Vanderbilt to develop the monoclonals, and then all of this sort of led to early development of vaccines and monoclonals that were critically needed early in the pandemic. And then I'll be showing you some of the work that we've done with Galit um, at Reagan Institute and then with Jesse Bloom here at the Fred Hutch to really sort of understand the immune response to infection and also with Leo and Andy as well. So this is a picture of us, Jan, England and I after we collected that very first sample from the first patient in the United States. So we went to the individual's house and we had to be in full PPE. Um, and back then we weren't wearing masks that, um, except you know, when we were in full PPE. And then this was that, that very first sample. And then this was the symptom monitoring that we did afterwards um, after we collected that sample. And that sample became the source of the monoclonal antibody that was later developed by Eli Lilly to be something that can be used now for, for treatments, early treatments, and also was the source of, of, um, of the samples that were used for, um, to service the clinical correlate for the early non-human primate studies of the mRNA vaccine. So we then subsequently, after enrollment of the very first case, then enrolled a cohort of about 300 individuals. And this was work led by Nick Franco, Caitlin Wolf, and, um, and Jenny Logue in my lab. And this was a, a heroic effort because back then it was very, very hard to enroll. Um, so we enrolled people in the hospital with moderate severe disease, as well as people with mild disease and those with asymptomatic infection outside of the hospital. And we followed them every 30 days, the first four months, and then now we're, we're out to every three months. As you can see, we, we were able to acquire a cohort across a range of disease um, severity. We had asymptomatic individuals. 
people with mild disease and people with moderate severe disease. And you can see that this really represents what, what is seen for SARS-CoV-2 in the United States that tends to be 40s to 60s. Um, and then the race ethnicity breakdown is about concordant. And then also um, some comorbidities, but actually not that many. One of the studies that we wanted to really do um, as we started seeing cases of long COVID pop up is to understand what was going on in Seattle because we had, since we had started enrolling in January, we had people out to um, six, nine, 12 months really. Um, at, and so we, we conducted follow up, um, a follow-up survey in these individuals to understand how many of them had, um, had signs and symptoms of long COVID. And, and the reason why we did this was because um, we had, uh, in comparison to the published studies, we had a cohort that was mostly mild disease or, or, um, or asymptomatic. So 220 of our 250 had mild, mild disease or were asymptomatic and were not hospitalized. And that was different from, from what had been published at the time. And so we, we, we asked them to about their symptoms at approximately um, six to nine months after illness. And we found surprisingly, and this was very surprising to me because I did not think that people with mild disease would, would be this symptomatic. We found that over 30% of, of people reported persistent symptoms and that 58% reported worse quality of life. And this is about to come out, um, but still, um, still under embargo. Um, okay. And then when we looked at the symptoms in these individuals, um, we really found that the acute symptoms are here on the left. Um, those with mild disease are the darker colors, those with Severe disease are the lighter colors. And then um, again, mild disease and the severe disease. You can see a lot of people had acute symptoms at acute illness, but that many of them, even those with mild disease, had symptoms that follow up at six to nine months. And this was pretty concerning to us. We did not um, think about that it would be this high. And I think it represents something that, that probably needs to be studied quite a lot more in terms of the proportion of people with mild disease who are um, experiencing long-term consequences of their coronavirus infection. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I wanted to just briefly go over three studies that we have done um, to really probe the immune response to um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And before I do that, I just wanted to quickly go over how SARS-CoV-2 um, attaches to the host cell. So this is a spike protein, it's on the surface of the virus, and this is the human ACE2 receptor, which is what spike protein attaches to, to enter the host cell. And then this is how it enters. It basically attaches and then it, 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 it uh, fuses there. Um, and the idea with antibodies is that they target this receptor binding domain of, of, SARS, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike, and then they prevent um, the fusion of, of RBD with, with the host cell. And these slides are courtesy of Barney Graham. Um, so really what we wanted to do very early on was to understand um, what, does the, what does the profile of an antibody response look like in somebody who has been infected and cleared SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so we took the samples from the first patient. And this was work that was done by Andy McGuire and Leo Stomatados at the Fred Hutch. And what they did was they took um, anti-SARS-CoV-2 specific B cells and isolated them and then they sequenced their B cell receptors. They generated monoclonals, and then they looked at um, the binding and neutralization potencies. And fortunately, what they were able to do is to identify several um, neutralizing antibodies, but one particularly potent neutralizing antibody that blocked the interaction of spike with the human ACE2 receptor. And he, they found importantly that these neutralizing antibodies were minimally mutated, um, suggesting that this is something that a lot of people could probably do, that they could generate minimally somatically hypermutated neutralizing antibody that could be protective against um, and help clear infection. So this was, this was great. Um, we also then wanted to look at these, um, looked at this over time. So this is work that was led by Kate Crawford, who is an MD PhD student in Jesse Bloom's lab, and who really did so much work early in the pandemic to sort of develop these assays and to do this work. So we had this cohort of 34 individuals um, very early on, again, in the pandemic, who had asymptomatic, mild or moderate severe disease, and they all recovered. And so we followed them out to three to four months. And she used um, a pseudovirus neutralization assay to really understand um, the kinetics of neutralizing antibody over time. Because really what you need to know is what does someone who recovered look like so that you have something to compare the vaccine against. And what she found importantly was that there was a fourfold decline in antibody titers from one to four months post-symptom onset. Um, and 
what you can see here is that across the different time points, so this is time point one, which is the acute time point, this is time point two, which was about one to two months, and this was about three to four months. And neutralization titers here on the um, y-axis, and then these divide into the different groups, asymptomatic, symptomatic never hospitalized, so the mild group, and then the severe group here. You can see that very early on at this acute time point, those who had severe disease had higher neutralizing antibody titers compared to those with mild, moderate, mild disease or, or asymptomatic. But that really everybody seemed to coalesce here by the, the third time point, that's three to four month time point, so that they all sort of ended up at the same set point. Um, I think this is really important because it indicates that you don't need to have very, very severe infection to arrive at the same set point at your at three to four months, um, that mild, moderate infection achieved the same, that they didn't decay faster because they had mild, mild moderate disease. We're now following out these samples or these, these individuals and collecting their samples out to now we're at a year. And so we're starting to map out how th these decay kinetics are looking over time. And this is actually very early data still, and we're still acquiring it right now. And we're working with a company called Nexilis. Um, in, uh, in Quebec, and then this analysis is led by Carolyn Duncan, who's a pathobiology student who rotated through my lab. And we're sort of trying to understand what are the predictors of the kinetics of decay, and, and how does this differ across the different severities? So, um, the, uh, so protection is mediated by neutralizing antibody, but it's also mediated by, by the non-neutralizing properties of antibodies. And so one of my colleagues, Gully Alter, at the Raygon Institute, um, we had been working together for a while looking at flu and RSV, and we really wanted to understand what, what sort of the profile, um, the antibody profile that was associated with successful recovery from initial infection. So she had a platform called System Serology, which is basically an, a way to look in an unbiased way at multiple um, different antibody functions and biophysical profiles, so the different isotypes against the different um, antigens. And we really looked at spike, RBD, and nucleocapsid here. And so this is what we did. We took samples from individuals who were hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 infection back in February, March. We then collected serum samples from them, and then we, um, we did this massive um, profiling, simultaneous profiling of their antibody profiles. And we were able to use these data to separate out the, the people, the, the, the early antibody profile of those who, who recovered and who were successful in clearing versus those who died and did not, um, did not clear. We really found that the differences um, were found in the response to spike protein and then to nuclear capsid. So this is a heat map. It shows um, correlation matrices of an their antigen-specific antibody titers. And essentially what you're looking for here is basically the, the redder it is, the more coordinated the response is. And the bluer it is, the less coordinated the response is. And you can see that here on the left in the convalescence that people had a very coordinated response early in infection. This is like five to 10 days after symptom onset. And that those who went on to die had a dysregulated uncoordinated response, and we particularly found this within the natural killer cell and complement pathways, that, that that pathway did not um, work in concert with their other antibody functions very early in illness. So then we used a machine learning approach to really look at these different um, antibody signatures and to really dial down what are sort of the predictors that we could use. Like if we were to design a vaccine and we want to simulate recovery. What, what do we really want to achieve? And so we found that it really came down to spike and nucleocapsid, that those who recovered tended to have more spike-specific IgM and spike-specific IgA, whereas those who went on to die tended to have um, responses to nucleocapsid, providing us a way to really sort of start to map out what was happening early in illness that would lead to people to be able to successfully handle their infection. So we have some follow-up work on this, which I don't have time to go over today, but I, I'd like to at some point, um, looking at these people at um, four to six months and to sort of understand what happens in, in these people over time. So in the very last bit of my talk, I just wanted to go over the work that we've just done in the last few weeks, which is um, to map out um, the antibody response um, to the new variants that are emerging. So there are two variants, or actually three variants that are emerging worldwide, there's, um, and they target um, mostly receptor binding domain. Um, and the, the concern with these new variants that are emerging is that they could have an effect on, um, 
on antibody response in those who previously infected or those who have been vaccinated. So this is again work that we did with Jesse Bloom's lab um, led by his graduate student, Ali Greeny, um, also a heroic effort done over the holidays where she used uh, Jesse's deep mutational scanning platform to probe um, probe the, the antibody response to different mutations of receptor binding domain. So in Jesse's platform, he takes a yeast cell, he expresses um, receptor binding domain mutations on the surface of the yeast. And so he'll he'll express up to 4,000 at a time. And he'll, he'll incubate this with serum antibody from people who have recovered or people who have, um, who have been vaccinated. And he'll sequence the RBD mutations that are present either before, um, before uh, before escape or after escape, and, and then he'll compare them. And essentially what you're looking for here is you're looking for evidence of, of escape from antibody from certain mutations that might be present in the community. So very early, um, so using Har the Harvey samples, what we did was we, we looked at these, these individuals. And the main thing to point out here is, is that um, as you look at these plots, this is mapping ac out across RBD. And the height of this is really corresponding to the degree of mutation um, or the degree of escape at, at that particular site. And so, um, so what you can see is that within individuals here, over time, this individual had this, this um, sort of this profile. And then about 100 days later, they had a very similar profile, as opposed to this individual here who had this profile with this kind of peak. And then over time, they really broadened over the course of 80 days or so. But that when you compare this individual subject B to subject G, that there was quite a difference. There was heterogeneity both within individuals and then across time within the same individual. So it really matters at who you're looking at and also when you're looking at them, when you're looking at their ability to, to control these new mutants that are arriving in, in Seattle. So, um, so then what we, what we wanted to look at was, was basically to look specifically at the, at the mutations, the variants of concern. So th this would be 501Y and 484K. And on the x-axis is the frequency of the mutations at each site. And on the y-axis is escape. And I think the main thing to point out here is that 501Y does not, um, does not lead to antibody escape. So people are able to control 501Y if they've been previously infected here in Seattle with SARS-CoV-2. But that people who are previously infected and we took their serum antibody and we probed it against 484K, um, there, th unfortunately there was evidence of escape with that. Um, and that's concerning. Um, I think the caveat of course is that as I showed you earlier, antibody is not just neutralizing antibody, you have non-neutralizing antibody, and you also have all the other components of your immune response to help control your infection. And that these are genetic vaccines so that they can, they and they are being um, modified at this time to address the mut mut new mutations as they um, as they take over um, the, the circulating uh, strains. So um, that's, so the, the lessons, so we're learning in future directions. So we're continuing these long-term follow-up studies. We're doing clinical immune profiling. Um, we're looking at responses to other vaccines. We want to really understand what prior infection does to your antibody evolution after vaccination. And then sort of in a full circle, I'd like to get back to what I was doing initially before the pandemic, which was maternal vaccination. And so we're starting studies of antibody kinetics and serum and breast milk in, in pregnant women who are vaccinated. So thank you. Um, these are this is how you want to you can contact me, and this is just a graphic from a comic book that was created about the Seattle flu study, which is fun and uh, was written by Ethan Sack. So thank you. John, I think you're muted. Oops. Uh, thank you. Uh, awful lot of information very quickly. People can put uh, questions in the um, uh, in, in the Q and A. Uh, we have one from Andrew Johnson uh, asking you how you envision uh, having to adapt the screening strategy or school infrastructure for surveillance to be effective in safe opening of schools. I'm sure, you've done yeah. it more than once. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I, I think. It's it's becoming clear that children are not the um, the the transmitters, so that uh, that 
or if they are, there's there's pretty good evidence that the, the measures that are already being taken, the masking and the social distancing and all of the things that, and ventilation will control that. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that, that I think will need to happen is probably um, providing the same sort of uh, mechanism to staff, um, to you know daily symptom attestations, swabbing when sick, um, potentially more swabbing in staff because they are sort of always in a high risk um, potential outbreak setting. Um, and then also um, massive testing once an outbreak is identified um, and of the classroom, of the household, of things like that to really sort of contain the, the, the outbreak before it, it spreads further. Great. Um, other questions? We had one just kind of technical about the swab, but that was early on. I think you went through that uh, later with some diagrams. Um, mm -hmm. There aren't any more. We're right at the hour. Uh, everyone, I really appreciate your attendance and Helen, uh, wonderful. Really, really very exciting. Uh, keep it going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.